Today I'm going to talk about safety of buildings and transport systems. In particular, um, in extreme conditions like explosive blast. And my PhDs and RAs have been concerned with developing strain visualization systems, and we're going to show you some of those in the demonstration, and also condition monitoring systems. So we've got three demonstrations. I hope they're all going to go okay. <laughs> Tony did say, well, if you've got three demonstrations, one's bound to go wrong, but we'll have to see how we get on. But we'll come to those shortly. First of all, I just want to give you a little bit of acknowledgement for the companies and organizations which have supported my research. And I've listed those there, UK and EU and US government and a number of companies that have supported this research. In particular, I'd like to thank Peter Fuller and Nick Shrubshaw from Instron who've come along today and they brought one of their, their new baby Instrons here which allows us to do a test in the lecture theatre and also Rob Wood from GOM and they manufacture the strain visualization, visualization software which we make use of. So, let's move on and the first topic that I want to talk about is blast resistance of laminated safety glass. I'm then going to show how that led on into our research on blast tolerance of composite structures. I'm going to take a look at high temperature condition monitoring. Then I'm also going to describe some of our strain visualization research which we've been doing with Professor Chang Zhu Lin in relation to forming of metallic alloys. And then I'm going to, towards the end of my lecture, I'm going to go back in time and describe some of my early research at Cambridge with John Field. I'm very pleased he's here today. I've got to be a little bit careful what I say because John is my PhD supervisor. So, and also when I came to Imperial, I'm going to talk about some of the early research that I did there with, with Gordon and Tony. So, the first topic is laminated glass. This is research done by Paul Hooper and more recently, Paolo Del Linz. The background, you remember Bishopsgate in 1993, Docklands in 1996, Istanbul in 2003, and these are all examples of glass facade structures which have been seriously damaged by explosive blast. Now we could live on, and work in a, in a bunker, but we don't like to do that. We like to live and play and so on in these large open plan glass facade structures. And there's a number of these in London which we all know about. And let's look at the worst case scenario. So this is if you should have an explosive blast incident on monolithic glass. So this is not toughened or laminated in any way. And you can see the blast wave closing in on the sheet of glass and it smashes into smithereens. So clearly if you're in an open plan office, that's a very undesirable situation. The threat is this. This is the typical blast signature. So the pressure rises rapidly to a few atmospheres then decays over a period of a few milliseconds in the case of an air blast and sometimes you get a, a sort of overshoot as well. So there's your typical input into the structure and the usual way that you design structures to resist this blast is to use laminated glass construction. So you can see here that the blast wave still impinges on the sheet of glass, it fractures the glass, but now the glass remains attached to the PVB interlayer. And the key here in the design of this is to control the, the limit of tearing of that PVB, but also the pull-out conditions from the joint. And those are the two things that we've focused on in our research. So what we do is we go to a a facility in the north of England and we conduct blast experiments and what you can see there 
is the explosive charge sitting on polystyrene blocks. And if you look, here you've got, on one side, you've got a clear laminated glass sheet, and on the other side, it looks black. What, in fact, it is, is a speckle pattern painted on that rear face. So that's what, why it looks, it's obscured in that case. This is a side-on view, and you can see there the charge sitting on the polystyrene blocks, and then within this cubicle is where we locate our high-speed cameras. And so this is research done by Dr. Paul Hooper, supported by Arup. And we use two high-speed cameras with an appropriate triangulation angle. And you can see here, if you look on the rear face of the laminated glass sheet, you can see what's effectively a very fine distribution of dots. In fact, they're quite big. At this scale, the panel is big and that means that those speckles need to be quite coarse. And the principle of this is that you have two cameras with a well-defined triangulation angle, and you can use calibration plates to effectively tell the cameras where that speckle pattern is and how it moves. And then the high-speed cameras track the movement of those speckle features. And you can do this for very small structures and large structures, and over different time scales as well. And this is using the software which we're going to show you in a moment. So here you can see the, the blast event going off. And if you look closely there, just ahead of the cubicle, you can see that the laminated glass sheet has been pushed in and then pulled outwards by this blast event. So we do a series of tests at different standoffs. And this is, shows here two particular cases. This one is 30 kilograms of C4 at 16 meters. And this one is the same charge, but closer in at 14 meters. So if I play this one first, you can see the flash of light, and then the whole laminated glass sheet gets pushed in and pulled out. If the charge is slightly closer, the effect of that is that, the, in this case, the laminated glass sheet gets pushed into the cubicle. Now, what we then do with the high-speed cameras is track all those speckles, and we can then build up a, a deformation map from that speckle data. And so you can see the center of the panel is, is fairly symmetric deformation, and it goes up to about a, a deflection of about 270 millimeters there. And if you look side on here, you can see that the blast wave initially moves the laminated glass sheet, and then you build up the, the membrane stresses that builds up that parabolic shape. And so Paul can gather data, a lot of data for each test. He's got the, the DIC data here, and he's also got the, the pressure time trace here. This curve here shows the center point displacement. And so this is very useful data when you come to do FE analysis. But he can go a stage further than that, and he can actually instrument the frame itself. And so he puts strain gauges on the inside and the outside edge. The speckle strain technique allows you to determine the angle of this frame, the laminated glass sheet, as it deforms. So you've determined this angle from the speckle data. And then you've got the output from these strain gauges, which allows you to determine the loading being transmitted through the support here. And key in the design of this is the silicon sealant which holds the laminated glass sheet onto this frame. So Paul can explore different, what's called bite depths, which is different width of overlap here, and see what the effect of the loading on the frame is and what the pullout condition will be. What we then do is come back to the laboratory, just downstairs there, and we use our high-rate Instron, and this can load samples at speeds up to 25 meters per second. It has a, a very special um, design of what's called a loss-motion device, where you, the shackle, which is loading the top section of the sample, moves initially, and then you get a, a sort of take-up condition, which then loads the sample. That allows the grip to get up to speed before you load the sample. And we've got one of these tests just to illustrate this. So here you're looking at 
the joint. This is the aluminium frame of your window. Here is the silicon sealant. And this is the laminated glass sheet. You can see the PVB there down the centre. So I'm going to play this and you'll see the laminated glass sheet being pulled at several metres per second, which simulates the, the blast condition. The PVB is stretching and then it separates away. And so what Paul has done here is to explore different conditions. So you, he's varied the, the bite depth, that's this dimension here, from 5 or 10 millimetres right up to 25 and 30 millimetres. And to find the condition when you, you change from a, a joint failure to tearing of the polymer interlayer. And that's useful because then we can feed that into the Home Office guidelines for the design of these structures and it's the, this 25 millimeter bite depth which is for example used in Heathrow Terminal 5 to give you that sort of that extra safety of the structure. He takes it a stage further and also does determines the stress strain properties of the polymer interlayer but this is so that you can in, input it into a FE analysis and to do that what you need to do is to take into account that the glass itself is still staying attached to the PVB interlayer so you can see here that as the PVB stretches these sections of glass which have been effectively pre-cracked to simulate the blast condition these generate little bridging zones and so what we end up with is a stress strain measurement of the PVB which takes into account this glass, and this is done with photoelasticity. And then you can put this together and build up a series of plots of your predicted deformation of your laminated glass sheet and also the experimental, this is it, comparing the experimental data with the theoretical predictions. The end result of all of that is design um, curves like this where this is reflected pressure at the glass facade. This is reflected impulse. And so for different threats going from very small quantities up to 500 kilograms, which would go in typically in a, a small van, you can see at the different standoffs, you move from different regimes. Here is where you've got first glass fracture up to this condition here where you get um, the limit of the PVB and it starts to tear. So this is a mixture of computer predictions and validated and benchmarked with experimental tests as well. Well, I went to a, a conference in Portugal and presented that data. And at that conference, there was a, um, a chap from the US Office of Naval Research, Yapa Rajapaksi. And he said, I'm interested in composite materials and assessing the blast resistance of these. And that's how the, the PhD project, which Harry Aurora started, of course, their interest is naval structures. And here is the new DGG class of um, destroyer, US Navy destroyer. All of this radar structure here is housed in composite. And although the, 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 sort of the main structure here of the ship is still steel, the, at the front of the ship you have a bow sonar dome, which is also composite. In fact, this is manufactured by a UK company. There are lots of other examples of where composites have found application here. And the Norwegian company, Yumo Mandel, they make hovercraft type vehicles which are all composite. And these are big and they can take a full size battle tank. There's also the, the Swedish um, high speed pursuit vessel, which is an all carbon fiber construction. And here is our own Type 45 destroyer. And you can see all of this structure here is composite. If you look closely, you can just see Eurofighter here banking round. So what we did is we went to Gurit on the Isle of Wight and asked them if they could make for us some composite sandwich panels which would be representative of marine structures so that we wanted large scale structures. And they, they fabricated for us panels which were typically about 1.6 meters by 1.3. They've got different foam core thicknesses, and we've got skins which are about two millimeters. And we took those to the north of England and did some blast tests on those. We also evaluated them 
in our lab. And this shows one of those big samples being evaluated in the 250 ton Instron. Obviously, we can't bring that into the lecture room, but Nick and Peter have brought the little baby Instron. So what we're going to do now is we're going to test, guys, we're going to test a composite sandwich panel and we're going to demonstrate to you the strain visualization technique. So ha Dr. Harry Aurora there has got one of these little composite test pieces. We've scaled everything down now to, to make it a little bit more manageable with, the, with our machine. This, is a, this particular Instron is one kilonewton. So the one that sits in the lab down there is 250 tons. This is a thousand times smaller load capacity. So you've got to switch to... Okay. So what we're going to do is load up this sample, and we've also got the strain vision, those two cameras which you can see in front here, and the light sources are the strain visualization cameras. So they're going to record the, they're going to, you actually see a video image from one of those cameras on the screen there. Have we started the test? No. Okay, Nick, off you go. So we're going to start to load up. I'll move out of the field of view here. So all being well, what we should see there is it's starting to deflect. Is it deflecting? Is anything happening there, Harry? Okay. So we're loading the sample up. There'll be a bit of indentation. And if you can... I know it's small, but if you look at what you're looking at there on the screen next to the Instron is in fact the load displacement trace. So it's fairly linear at first, but then as we get more indentation, you should see a little bit of curvature. It's in compression, so you, the curvature will sort of flatten it off. And I can see a bit of flexing there. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> My eyes are not as good as they used to be. So all this time this has been captured, Rob is capturing data on his laptop system and we're going to analyse that now in a moment to generate the, the strain data. So should we switch to that? There, that's great. So what you're, what you're looking at here is not actually this test, it's one we did previously. But it's <laughs> <laughs> we have to be sure we've got something to show. So you can see there on the left is the vertical displacement, so it's color keyed, so zero is red. So as it plays now, it should get yellow and green, and you should see a little bit more displacement under the central roller. In the bottom right, you can see the strain at a particular point on the sample, which is going up in a linear fashion. And the, the right-hand plot is the shear strain. So you're starting to see some light blue either side of the roller. And that will, under the roller itself, there is no shear, shouldn't be. But over to either side, between, effectively between the two, the outside roller and the central roller, you're starting to pick up those regions of high shear. So I think that's good. I think we've demonstrated that one. Is the test still going? Uh, test this stage. Okay, that's great, guys. Let's, let's stop at that point and I'll carry on. So this is, these are the sort of mechanical tests which we do in the lab using the strain visualization system. What we're going to now do is go to the north of England where we do our blast tests. And what you can see here, what looks like a football, is the explosive charge sitting on those polystyrene blocks. And we've taken the same sort of composite sandwich material and we've adhesively bonded a steel frame to that clamped it to the front of the cubicle. Over here is the steel plate. And you can see there the charge in the middle. There's the cubicle. And then we have a concrete block here, which allows us to make our pressure measurements at the same standoff. So now you're close in. You can see the charge there. And there's the, the composite sandwich panel. We put a series of lines so we've got a camera at the front which can photograph what's going on. But what we're really interested in is what's going on in, on the back of the sample, and there you can see the speckle pattern. In the early days when we did this, there was a little bit of suspicion about whether we were going to get accurate data. 
And so we also have a laser gauge, which is a cantilever with a laser on its end, just to give an independent measurement. And there we have the two high-speed cameras, as you saw before. So that's the charge going off from a safe distance. And now you've, you're close in. That this is the video of the front of the panel. So you'll see, if I this is the worst-case scenario. So this is when the charge is very close. You'll see the fireball from the charge. And it's probably too quick to see the crack. So I'll play that. I'll go back and do that one again. If you look now closely down this left-hand edge, you should just see the crack propagating down that left-hand edge. That left-hand edge is not so well supported, and that's why the crack initiates there. So we do this at a series of different standoffs. This shows the charge at 14 meters. This is the worst case when the charge is closest at 8 meters. And if I play these, you can see the deformation here goes up to about 60 millimeters here. This one, it goes up to about 130 millimetres. And if you look at that right-hand edge, it is moving slightly. That's because it's not as rigid as the corner. And then we go into, we, we capture the data, we run our strain visualisation software on it, and this shows we lose the data in this region because of the, the laser gauge. But you can see it's fairly symmetric, and you're most of your... This is displacement here, out of plane deflection. is fairly symmetric. And this one, the blast is closer in at 8 metres. And you start to see a little bit of asymmetry here with a bit more deflection on the right. And then we analyse these data to give you the strain plots. So you're looking at the principal strain here. And you'll see there's a high region of strain there in the middle. And this one, where the charge is very close, if you look carefully, you should just see a little bit of a discontinuity and strain there. And that's because the front skin has failed, the core has failed, the rear skin is still intact, but because you've got this core failure in front of that, it has an effect on the rear skin. And so what Harry does is then puts the data together in a format like this, so he has the displacement, he has the principal strain and the shear strain, He's got the pressure time signature, he's got the center point displacement, and he's also got the images here showing the cracking processes. Now we can then also model that, and we need to take into account the skin and the core properties and build up a, a model for the whole of the composite. But also you need to, you need to take into account the, the way it's attached to the steel cubicle. And it's, it, because of the, the slight asymmetry of the, the setup, we've got more support down this edge than down this edge. So when I play that, you can see here the displacement of the composite panel, but also some displacement of the steel front of the cubicle. That in turn affects the stresses and, of course, the strains, and that's the strains which ultimately drive the failure process and cause the, the cracking to occur down this right-hand edge. And here you can see the, the damage for the worst case. So you've got a crack which is running from this corner down this edge here. And this is very typical of these panels when we test them. What's happening here is that the initiation process is starting in the corner where the, the panel is built in and constrained. But in the center of the panel, it's deflecting. And in that transition zone is where the cracking initiates. And when you, when you section this, in fact, we're doing some work with Southampton where we're, we're putting all this into a, an X-ray tomo tomographing machine and getting a 3D section. But here, this is what we've done here is just a section through the sample. And you can see you've got these cracks running down from one skin. This is the, the glass fiber skin on one side down to the glass fiber skin on the other side. And these are running down at 45 degrees. So we've got a combination of shear cracks and we've got some delamination. Well, we didn't fail that sample over there. We did that intentionally. In fact, the machine didn't quite have the capacity to, to fail the sample. But we are going to fail the next one. So, Paul, where are you? Paul has set up the high-speed camera. And we've enlisted some help from my son here as well, James and Harry. So what we've got here is we're going to take that test a stage further. We've got the same composite sandwich panel, a little beam of this. 
It's mounted on two rollers in much the same way as the one over there is. We've got the high-speed sc high camera to record it. We're going to lift the drop weight. Harry's going to do that. James, remember, you've got to go at the signal, all right, and not before. Okay, because Paul's got to get the camera primed. There we are, we broke it. Well done. <laughs> so the, the point is that, of course, in this dynamic test, this material stiffens up and is much more prone to fail. And we've got, we've got the data captured there. So you're looking at the end of the, the barrel, or the end of the, the drop weight machine, and we're going to process the data and play this back in slow motion. In the old days, we used to do it in the old days, we used, to do, we used to do it with film, but these days it's all captured digitally. And you can see there it coming down. And the foam, the sheer cracking at 45 degrees, as you saw a moment ago. So there, down it comes. That's nice, actually. Sheer crack. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, James. Thank you. You're a good trainee. Of course, we've got a brand new big Instron sitting down in the new lab. Um, it was bought with, I think, aero mo faculty money, I should say. So MechEng is going to be using that, Jeff, if we can. So this is, a, this, is a, this is one of Sean Crofton's students, actually, who does work on elastomeric material. But he's, he's interested in using that drop weight machine as well. We also do underwater blast tests. And I'm not going to go into these in any detail. I'll just show you one of the, the examples. This is where we submerge the composite panel in the water. We have pressure sensors here. We also have a charge, which we drop in at an appropriate depth. And we do this across a lake. Well, it's not a lake. It's really a, a, very, a very large um, sort of man-made um, pond. And there, you, the complication you have now is you've got the shock traveling through the water, but you've also got a bubble collapse process. So we do, we have a, a little submarine for these experiments. Our initial plan, and that's the submarine down there, our initial plan was to put a high-speed camera in this submarine and try and capture some DIC data. But I'll play the little video clip. This is the view from the submarine. And you can see the water is not particularly clear. It doesn't really meet EC blue water directives or whatever, it's very murky and of course you can't really do the DIC through that murky water. So we use conventional strain gauges and also we also look at composite tubes as well because um, ONR are interested in tubular structures. Well I won't go into that now but what I will say is that there's some very big shock and blast activities which take place in the college and Bill Proud's with us, I know. And one is the Institute of Shock Physics. And that's Bill's big gas gun there, which I think is, if I've got it right, is 1.3 kilometers per second. And the projectile is this sort of size. So it's kilograms of mass that it's accelerating. And on the right is the Royal British Legion Center for Blast Injury Studies, which is focused on finding ways to protect troops serving in Afghanistan and other places when they can be subject to blast when they're in their vehicles. So those, in fact, Bill is involved in both of those, but Professor Anthony Bull is the, the director of the Blast Injury Study Center. Okay, well, that brings me on to the next topic, which is high temperature materials for the next generation of USC or ultra supercritical power plants. And these are the types of power generation plant which sometimes are called clean coal, and the idea is to run these at very high temperatures and increase the efficiency. And Paul is the, currently the postdoc on this project. Our particular work package we're involved in is headed up by Andy Morris, who's also here tonight. And this is a, quite an ambitious project to look at the whole process of running the power station at high temperatures and also capturing the CO2. It turns out you 
you can only really capture the CO2 if you increase the efficiency of your, your power generation process. And we're not so involved in the, the carbon, dioxide, carbon dioxide capture and pumping underground. That's left to our Spanish partner, Quiden. But what we're interested in is condition monitoring that can be applied to the materials which are used for the high-pressure steam pipes and headers in a power station. And there are a lot of these. Andy has taken me around these power stations at different times. And it's quite formidable when you see all these pipes. And these things are pressurized to very high pressures, several couple of hundred bar, and very high temperatures, typically 580 degrees C. But if you're talking about raising the temperature of the steam to up to 700 degrees C, then you need to use high temperature materials. And really, you're in the game of nickel-based alloys. And the guys at E.ON have done some calculations on this and worked out that to build one of these power stations, you're going to use the world's supply of nickel in one year. So the reality is it may not be nickel that is used. Probably more likely is the chromium phytic steels and pushing those to higher temperatures with coatings and other technologies. Well, we're interested in these, these processes and also assessing the lifetime of the components and with our friends at RWE and TUV, we have a, a component test which they promise, the, promise us they're going to start very soon. We've been waiting now for a, a little while. And on that component test, we have a technique which has been developed by Peter Nagy at the University of Cincinnati and Peter Corley here in Mechenge. And there's a PhD student, Joe Corcoran, and also... Um, a young lecturer, Catherine Davis, is also involved in this. This is a technique called potential drop anisotropy. And I'm not, I'm gonna, I'm not gonna go into the detail of that. I'll leave that to the experts to describe. But the, a, the, this technique relies on injecting current through two probes and measuring the voltage drop across two neighboring probes. And if you do that in one direction and then do it at 90 degrees and then look at the relative resistance ratio you take away all the thermal and other, other effects, and you can start to pick up the formation of creep voids and other features that are limiting the lifetime of your component. So that's a technique that we're developing. Well, we're not developing, but it, we're, we're applying it in, this, in the context of this project. And we're also interested in optical techniques for measuring strain, like the ArcMax system, which is effectively you put little pips on the surface and track the, the silicon nitride or ceramic pips, and we're also interested in developing and applying the high temperature coatings type of technology, which is the strain visualization type of system. So this is putting a speckle pattern using high temperature paints, which stays in place, and then you track, if particularly over a weld, because welds are obviously key sites where you want to put this strain visualization technique into place. So we also apply strain visualization to metal forming. And this is an EPSRC project with my colleagues Daniel Ballant and Zhang Zhu Lin. There are eight universities involved in this, and this is looking at a combination of metallic alloys, also composites. The idea is to give vehicles at the end of their life to recycle the materials. So clearly we want to move away from steels and goes more towards aluminium and magnesium alloys and also composite materials because they're light. The strain visualization technique that is used here is one which OMA has been applying. It's again, it's a commercial technique in which a, a, a series of markers are put on the component and then the component is deformed and you can use the camera system in much the same way as you saw over there in this case, you put the, the component, you form it, and you have a series of little calibration plates here, which provide sort of references for the cameras. And here you have the, the camera, that the, the turntable then rotates, and you capture a series of images of this, and you can then build up a three-dimensional picture of what's happened to the component after it's formed. Well, we, we have a number of other metal forming activities and other research taking place in the department and we've developed over the last few years some very close collaborations with 
China in particular, AVIC and CASA. And of course the, the lead person in this is Professor Zhang Zhu Lin, which you can see there. Just to his um, right is the president of, of CASA. This is when we signed a memorandum of understanding. That's me on the left. It's a bit of optical distortion, which makes me look a bit overweight there. So. <laughs> and of course, we now have two new centers, the AVIC Center for Structural Design and Manufacture and the AVIC Center for Materials Characterization, Processing and Modeling. The one on the right is joint with the Department of Materials, with Professor Fionn Dunn. And these, there are several staff. I haven't listed all the staff involved in these. There are several academic staff involved. And these centers are su to support PhDs and, and postdocs working in relevant research areas. Well, I've got a little bit of time left, so what I thought I'd, I'm going to do in the last um, 10 minutes or so is to describe my research with John Field when I was at the Cavendish lab, and that's where I did my PhD. And John and I were interested in a number of processes. One was the interaction of a shock wave with a cavity, a possible hotspot formation as well. We were also interested in the problem of rain, if you have rain impact against aircraft at moving at high velocity or hail impact. And this led on to some research that we did on the ballistic performance of armor protection systems as well. And I've got a picture of those days and you can see there John there he, in those days, he was head of this group, PCS. Um, that's me there with some hair in those days. So James might want to note that. That's David Townsend to my, on my right, on my left. And up there is David Tabor, who we, all, who we all know. So my research was looking at cavity collapse. And what we do, did is to devise an experiment where we put a thin liquid layer with a cavity and we did this it was a two-dimensional experiment so we had a thin layer of liquid with a cavity and it was sandwiched between two um, armored gla glass plates and then we did a sort of tricky experiment where we fired from a, a gas gun a flyer plate which you can see just entering here and in the ideal condition it went cleanly between the two glass plates and banged into the liquid target, but there were some instances where it didn't quite make it. But we, th this is the case where it worked perfectly. So what you can see here is the impact generated. What happened when, the imp when this slider impacted against the liquid, it generated a shock. And in those days, I used a technique called Schlieren, which involved concave mirrors. And this allowed you to visualize the shock passing through the material. And so you can see here the, the edge of this, that's the shock there. And there's the cavity. And what we found is that the cavity collapses down to form this jet. And you can see the jet forming there. We were interested in the heat generation in that cavity collapse process. And so we used photomultipliers to capture that. And what you're looking at here is effectively a two-dimensional um, bubble, if you like, or a, a cylinder being collapsed. The jet has impacted this point, but it's closed off these two regions either side of the jet impact, and in those regions you've got gas compression to very high temperatures, and so those potentially can act as hot spots. Of course, what we're we were interested in is the, the hot spot conditions from the point of view of safety of these materials. We were also interested in possible cavity collapse processes where you get interactions. So in this case, we, have, we had a series of cavities in a line. Here you can see the shock coming in <coughs> below from the bottom. That's a reflected wave from the shock. You can see the jet starting to form. This cavity then collapses. And at about this frame here, you can see a secondary shock generated. And that secondary shock then starts the collapse of this second cavity. And so you get this sort of chain reaction process taking place. This was, this, the reason we were interested in this was because the, we were interested in clusters of cavities. But it turns out that in recent times, the um, 
Eric Lauer and his group at Munchen have done some modeling of these events. And you can see here a, an array of three cavities collapsing in much the same way as is being observed here in the experiments. We've got the experiments on the left and the model simulations here on the right. And you can see all the same sort of processes with the, the shock generation and the subsequent collapse of the cavity. Of course, our interest was really to try and explain why, when you look at damage on a subject, like a propeller blade or some other component, <laughs> often the damage is large scale, much bigger than a, a single cavity. And so we, were, we, we, would, we developed this approach to try and understand how cavities collapse in arrays. And so you can see here an experiment where we've got effectively a, a rectangular array of cavities and you can see the shock passing up through this layer and it collapses one layer first and then subsequently collapses other layers. And if you imagine a, a hemispherical cloud of cavities, you can imagine how the shock would, could then focus towards the center and produce this region of damage at the center here, bigger, much bigger than a single cavity. The other area of research which we were interested in was the liquid drop impact problem or rain erosion. And this shows the same technique where we had effectively a thin slice of liquid being impacted by a flyer plate, in this case at about 150 meters per second. Again, we could, using a, a Schlieren technique, we could photograph the shock and you can see here the, the, this region where you get very high pressures. The shock then passes up this free surface and generates outflow of liquid. And this jetting process is, is at remarkably high, t high velocities. And then you get an interaction where the shock goes onto the rear face and then comes back and focuses again. So I was studying, in my PhD, I was studying these shock interactions and, and trying to explain the the damage that would be produced. And I had a colleague who's here today who was looking at the actual materials. And these were, there were some quite exotic materials. I think at one point David was testing sapphire, but zinc sulfide was co fairly commonplace. These are all special materials which were infrared transmitting window materials. And you can see that you get some interesting damage patterns from a single impact where you get a little fine array of cracks. And that's because the, in the impact event, it's a very short duration loading of the structure. And that's in that short duration loading, you, the cracks can only grow a small distance. We had a colleague, Marty Lesser, at KTH Stockholm. And he was our, he was our expert theoretician. And he did some very nice um, detailed analysis of these problems. And it was, it was a very good, good collaboration period. So we got a PhD, and that was me getting my PhD with <laughs> my mother and father outside the, the Senate House. And then I moved to Imperial College and started as the BP Chemicals lecturer with Gordon and Tony. And in the early days, I was doing research on fast fracture of polyethylene pipe materials. A lot of interest then that you, you now know see all the plastic pipes, the, the gas and the water pipes which are, are used under the roads, but there was a concern in those days about cracks running at length, long, along distances along these pipes. And so we set out to do some experiments in the laboratory and some of the PhDs involved in those experiments are listed there. And we developed a, a technique which we're going to demonstrate in a moment, which is we, called it, we coined it the frozen tongue technique. And what we did was to take a, a small section of material about sort of this wide, load it uniaxially in, a, in an Instron testing machine, an old one in those days, but it was a, still an Instron, and we cooled a tongue section on the left there. And we cooled this with liquid nitrogen. And the principle of this is that you can preload these samples to different levels, but the polyethylene material, when you, when you try to fracture it in the lab, it's actually remarkably difficult to fracture in the lab because the, the crack tends to blunt out and you get tearing. And so what we did, we needed a way of initiating a crack. And the idea we came up with was that we 
if we cooled this section of the material here just locally with liquid nitrogen, we could then, with a three-point bend device, we could then initiate a crack in this tongue. And it just so happened at that time um, we were refurbishing my house with a new kitchen. And I bought this new this tile cutter in those days. It was, it was 25 years ago now. And the tile cutter turned out, it worked on ceramic. Well, let's try it on this frozen polymer. And in fact, I lost that tile cutter, but Paul sourced one from Amazon for me. And we're going to demonstrate this now. So we're going to demonstrate with James, his uh, trusty helper. We're going to demonstrate with, with some liquid nitrogen, because Nick comes to put in, a, put in a special request for some liquid nitrogen. So here we are, gloves and all kit. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of the first generation of frozen tongue specimens. These were actually made in my garage. There were some old ones which I found in the filing cabinet the other day. All the ones that we later used were, were nicely engineered in our labs, but these ones have the sort of characteristic shape. What Paul is going to do is cool the tongue in liquid nitrogen. Oh, first of all, you're going to... Sorry, I'm out of sequence here. First of all, we're going to demonstrate how tough this material is. Do you want to switch to visualizer? Yeah. If I touch visualizer. So that's the, sam that's the, the sample. So we're going to try and break it without cooling it. And you can see this is jolly good material. Polyethylene. BP would like this because it doesn't break. Okay. So that's the first test. We're gonna, that demonstrates that the stuff doesn't break. Now what we're going to do is cool it with some liquid nitrogen. Paul's got a special <laughs> system. Don't try this one at home, folks. Are you ready there, James, with your clamper? Yeah. Good. So we've got a special little wooden container which you pour the liquid nitrogen into. It's got a little polystyrene gland at one end. So the liquid nitrogen goes into that container and then just it remains captive there so that the liquid nitrogen is really only cooling the, the tongue section. How are you doing? Good. So when we've got it nice and cold, minus 160 degrees C, we're then going to initiate a crack in the tongue all being well. You can do this over the visualizer, right? Line her up. <laughs> Is that liquid nitrogen gold? <laughs> We're going to do it again. We've got to get this to work. One of them had to go wrong. Yeah, that's true. This is going to become Tony's, Tony's prediction. This is Tony's rule. <laughs> there was one of these polymers which was a really high molecular weight one, which is probably that. That's the one, actually. <laughs> Try, have you got another sample? He's, they're determined to get this to work. Is that the only sample we've got? <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well done, guys. You better do a bit of weight training, James. <laughs> okay, so the principle of this, let me go back to the slide. So you can see you initiate the crack in the tongue section, and the crack then runs in, and depending on the loading condition, if the load in here is quite modest, the crack will run in and arrest. But if you've got sufficient load in the main section, the crack will then run all the way through. And in fact, we used a, an Imacon camera in those days. It used to produce a series of pictures on a, a Polaroid back. And 
we can then build up a series of curves. And this shows some different, here's some polyethylene material in here. We found that there was a, a characteristic, a threshold load, which needs to be above to get the crack to propagate in the main section. But then once you go above that condition, the crack velocity increases, but it tends to reach a limiting value. And it turned out that the tougher the material, and there's a range of different toughnesses of material here. You've got, up here you've got, this is styrene acrylonitrile, nitrile, which is fairly brittle, down to polyethylene and ABS, and ABS is very tough. And you can see these materials which have a high threshold and very resistant to fracture also tended to have a low limiting crack velocity or maximum crack velocity. Well, it turned out that um, Gordon did some analysis of this. And what he did was to take a sample with a, effectively a starter crack in. As you load this to different levels, you can model the system by considering it as a, a spring mass system. So you have here the mass of the sample. In fact, the moving parts of this sample were determined by the, the crack length. So in fact, the mass was a function of crack length. And the stiffness of the sample was also a function of crack length as well. Because as the crack grows, the whole thing becomes more compliant. And the fixture itself, the testing machine, it had a compliance. And you could build that all into the model. And when you, you work that through, my daughter would like this. She's getting good at solving differential equations. There's a nice little differential equation for you to solve. And when you solve it, then you get a relationship between crack velocity and load which has this characteristic form with a threshold load and also a limiting crack velocity which is what we observed experimentally. And so we could explain these threshold and crack velocity processes in terms of this model which was useful. My time is running out so I'm going to go very quickly through this final point which is we also looked at antioxidant loss from polymers. And the reason we were interested in that, this was a separate PhD project and a number of students were involved in this, is that the aging of polymers over a long period of time is determined by antioxidant loss. And aggressive agents like chlorine in water can diffuse into a polymer and start to consume the antioxidant. And we, we analyze those processes. We, when you look at the at the inside of a pipe surface where water has been flowing through it after a long period of time you find this fine network of cracks which is a bit look, looks a bit like a mud surface which has dried out and here you can see those those little cracks it turns out that those cracks are determined by processes crack growth processes which take place and this is promoted by the presence of oxidizing agents Gordon and Alan developed a, a model here which determined the lifetime of these components and took into account the, the presence of those aggressive agents. And we received a, a medal for that, the George Stevenson Medal from the IMEC-E. And there's a picture there just a, nearing the end now, just a, that's at the IMEC-E receiving. A, Nick Mason was the PhD student that did this research and there's a two, we had, we had a medal each which was very kind of them to do two medals. And then here's a picture of more recent times of me walking along the, the Great Wall. I've had two, two trips to the Great Wall. It's a fantastic thing. You must go and see it if you haven't. And in fact, I've walked along this section here from in the distance there. You can see it's about five kilometers. We did, we did the whole length of that. Well, before I close, I would just like to say something. Gordon and Tony, when I started, they said, if you can, link up with some medics. So I did have a couple of medical connections. One was my father-in-law. He's a retired police surgeon. He's here tonight, and he's a retired GP. In fact, he's an alumnus of Imperial College. And my other um, contact is another alumnus of Imperial College, Gerald Finnerty. And we were at college together, and Gerald does research on neurodegeneration. And he came to me one day and said, can you devise some little polymer actuators which we can put in the MRI scanner, the Hammersmith MRI scanner? And we did this, we manufactured some little tiny, we did it with some final year projects, and manufactured some little tiny shuttle type devices which were all polymer and they were driven by pneumatics. And these were used to stimulate nerve endings so that you could understand the, 
the effect of stimulus on brain activity. Well, I must acknowledge all the PhDs. Without all their help, none of this would have been possible. And I've listed them all there, the current ones and the, the past PhD students. Of course, my family, my wife and Caroline and James, on one of our holidays. And we did have the Imperial Festival last, a couple of weeks ago now. And we did a little demonstration at the Imperial Festival. And we did manage to persuade the, the rector. We had a, a surfboard. And we did strain visualization on the surfboard. And we got the rector to, to stand on the, the surfboard. You can see he's, in, he's got a good pose. And um, my son and I did a little bit of a, took a bit of li liberty with this picture. And we've just transformed it. <laughs> we, know he like, we know the rector likes to travel, so that's a... <laughs> and then my final slide then. So our aim really is to take PhDs and RAs to the cutting edge of materials technology. I'm going to stop there.